This video is sponsored by Ground News. With election season upon us, the forces of politics are pulling us apart. And among the sharpest battles recently is a campaign to ban certain books from public schools. There were more than 3,000 book bans in schools last year, a thousand more than the year before. So, on January 17th, 2024, the Boston Globe reported on a seemingly coordinated effort in schools to ban this children's book. Woke, A Young Poet's Call to Justice by Mahogany L. Brown, Elizabeth Acevedo, and Olivia Gatwood, with illustrations by Theodore Taylor III. When I saw this book making headlines, I decided to purchase a copy for myself. I read it from cover to cover and couldn't exactly decipher why a reasonable person would call to ban this book from schools. On the back of the book, it lists the topics of every poem inside, from activism to the titular woke. If you'll indulge me, allow me to read just two of my favorite poems from the piece, the poems about body positivity and gender. The Good Body You know your joints that bend and straighten, your mouth and ears and eyes, your limbs that lengthen, as you reach for the earth or clouds. You know your hair that maybe coils upward stretching or falls straight down your back. Your body can be a jungle gym of movement, your body can be a chapel of quietude. Your body can roll and grow like a long sentence, your body can be like small mighty punctuation. Your body can be encased in metal adorned with wheels, it can need medicine and extra support. Sometimes your body can make you angry or sad, because it doesn't look how you want it to, or it doesn't do what you'd like it to, because it might have limits that you want to move beyond. But remember, even on the days you aren't feeling yourself, your body is always a good body, because it carries the good in you. And as mentioned previously, this is the poem about gender. In between, there is light. Imagine a rainbow. Now, imagine a rainbow without just seven colors, but hundreds of colors, the lights and darks of every shade, neon colors, in between colors, colors you're not sure what to call. Now imagine that someone points to this rainbow and says, there are only two colors. Imagine that this person says that one color is a boy and the other is a girl. What would you say? Maybe you would run your hand along it like a river, point to all of the hues and tones. Maybe you would ask, how can you say that? Look at how many there are. The truth is, there are so many shades between boy and girl. People who are neither, people who are both people who live somewhere in the middle. We don't have to choose. We can just be. And if someone pointed at one part of the rainbow and said, this color is better than all of the others, what would you say? Maybe you would run your hand along it like a piano, play a little song with every unique note. Maybe you would ask, how can you say that? Listen to the song they play together. Sometimes, the world wants one color of the rainbow to be louder than the rest, stronger than the rest, bigger than the rest. Do you know what I tell them? I say, look up into the sky. Do you see it? Look how perfect it is as a whole. Now, do I love these poems? Eh, I think they're pretty good. But one thing to keep in mind is that I'm not the target audience. This is a book primarily for children. I think that shows in the level of the words chosen. And even though they're not the best poems I've ever read, and even though I'm not the intended reader, I still think these poems are important and deserving of a place in a school library. They teach complicated, necessary concepts in ways that children can understand, and open doors for deeper discussions. Nevertheless, at least 10 districts decided to restrict access to this book, according to the Boston Globe. When Martin Elementary School banned Woke from its library, North Attleboro Council member Darius Gregory was furious. I'm sitting here as the only black face in this room and I'm embarrassed. The superintendent defended the initial decision by saying the book was not appropriate for all age groups at the elementary school, noting that the book was moved to the teacher's resource library and out of the student's library. Having read the book myself, I disagree with the assertion of age appropriateness. Even if the book is best suited for or understood by kids ages 8 to 12, I can't imagine a 5-year-old picking this book up would have any sort of adverse reaction to the content. Gregory walked out of a town council meeting on the subject as an act of protest. He could only speculate as to why the book was being challenged in the first place. He told CBS, Maybe it was the essence of the book. It's about speaking up and speaking out. After meeting privately with Gregory, the superintendent decided to reverse the ban. 
He put out a statement saying, Upon reflection and in light of the dialogue that remains ongoing within our community, I have decided that the right course of action is to restore the book's place in our library. School committee chairwoman Tasha Buzel said of the ordeal, I'm disappointed in a lot of ways. I think there were a lot of procedural failures. I think um, there's a lot of conversation that could have been had that wasn't. Now look, it's probably quite clear that I'm biased. Every person in the world is biased in one way or another. Having read Woke, I don't see anything herein that would justify a ban. Frankly, I think the illustration of a young black girl on the cover along with the title Woke, which was probably meant to be provocative, led to this book being banned in multiple districts. But hey, as long as we're talking about the push to ban books, did you guys hear that Ron DeSantis signed a bill to now limit book objections in school libraries? It might be that this news flew under the radar for you. It certainly did for me. Luckily, we can find out more about the story thanks to today's sponsor, Ground News. You've likely heard of Ground News. It's a website and app that gathers news sources from around the world and across the political spectrum to help you cut through the bias of every story. You guys can check out Ground News at my link, ground.news slash roughest drafts. I honestly support Ground News' mission immensely, and I was super happy to have them reach out to me. As someone who loves to read and write, I recognize that bias is everywhere. Looking at that story about DeSantis, we see that 32 different sources have covered this story. Of the sources whose biases are tracked, we see that 48% are left-leaning. In comparing headlines and excerpts, we see that right-leaning organizations use words like abuse, or in the case of Fox News, the word weaponize, which isn't used by any other outlet in any other headline. On the other hand, left-leaning sources tend to rely on the word limiting, with one right-leaning source also using the word. You'll notice that we can also see individuals, corporations, and conglomerates attached to each news organization. We can click on each headline to read the story straight from the source. Ground News is independently owned and not a news publisher. It aggregates news from a wide variety of sources and puts them all into one place. By comparing coverage on any given story, we learn to think critically about these events. You can go to ground.news slash roughest drafts right now to subscribe for 40% off unlimited access, which is what I use. You can use this QR code or the link in the description and pinned comment. Thanks to Ground News for sponsoring this video. As one might imagine, book banning is a pretty controversial issue. When I did my video on Shel Silverstein's A Light in the Attic, I pointed out how that book was heavily challenged from the moment it was published well into the 90s. A lot of people did not take too kindly to what I had to say about book banning in a broader sense. When I asserted that there was a present day push to ban books, multiple commenters disagreed with me saying there was no effort to ban books, just an effort to protect kids and keep them away from sexually explicit material. But was Shel Silverstein's book dangerous to children? Was it sexually explicit? And for a more modern example, how about Woke? So if books like Woke aren't explicit, why are they being challenged? As Olivia Gatwood, one of the book's authors, told the Bay State Banner, books like Woke threaten the conservative educational goals. To that point, it's important we define what book banning is. PEN America's definition is quite thorough. Any action taken against a book based on its content and as a result of parent or community challenges, administrative decisions, or in response to direct or threatened action by lawmakers or other government officials that leads to a previously accessible book being either completely removed from availability to students or where access to a book is restricted or diminished. On the topic of censorship, I want to highlight what Christina Dobbs told the Bay State Banner. Dobbs works as an assistant professor at the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development at Boston University. She said, When we talk about censorship, we're not talking about parents saying, I don't want my own child to engage with a particular work. We're talking about when the challenge asks that no one have access to a particular work. Indeed, if conservatives were concerned with parental rights, book banning wouldn't be an issue. Parents would just opt their students out of certain curricula or library books. I would probably disagree with that action on a personal level, but I wouldn't be able to argue with the parental right. The issue is that parents who ban books want to have rights over other parents' children. So why do a handful of parents want to encroach on other parents' rights? Why do people try and ban books? Let's take a look at what ProCon.org has to say on the matter. This website is dedicated to approaching issues on both sides, so let's try to approach the argument in good faith. The three major arguments in favor of book banning are 1. Parents have the right to decide what material their children are exposed to and when. 2. 
Children should not be exposed to sex, violence, drug use, or other inappropriate topics in school or public libraries. And three, keeping books with inappropriate content out of libraries protects kids, but doesn't stop people from reading those books or prevent authors from writing them. On paper, these ideas seem somewhat reasonable. We even discussed that first argument and said it would appear to be within parents' rights. So, with these arguments in mind, the question becomes, is banning a book ever justified? Well, educators don't seem to think so. A survey from First Book found that 46% of educators said book banning is never justified, while 41% more said it's rarely justified. 9% answered sometimes justified, with 2% saying often justified. Furthermore, 71% of teachers agreed that book bans undermine educator expertise, 40% agreed that bans erase people and histories, and 36% agreed that restrictions discourage critical thinking. Although, to be fair, 4% agreed that a book ban could help a teacher. So, there's that. But okay, so teachers don't support widespread book banning. Big deal, right? Teachers, what do they know? All they do is study for years and throughout their entire lives to know what's best for students. Big whoop. They wouldn't know of any material harm that banned books cause children. Thank goodness Christopher J. Ferguson conducted a study regarding the relationship between banned books and young readers. To quote and summarize some of his results, Ferguson found that, on the positive side, reading banned books was positively associated with civic and volunteering behaviors, although no causal attributions can be made from a correlation study. One possibility is that reading challenging books may be eye-opening and move individuals to help others once they understand the difficulties some others may face. He continued, The opportunity to expose oneself to and consider ethical dilemmas may foster higher-level thinking about these issues and promote more civic-mindedness, even if the material itself is dark. The study also noted that banning books was counterproductive in creating teaching moments between adults and youth. However, Ferguson also acknowledged that the youth willing to read banned books are just more conscientious in general. Reading banned books did not predict nonviolent or violent crime or contribute to school GPA. Taken together, these results suggest that the influences of banned books on behavior are not worrisome and may be positive overall. In the interest of fairness, I should also point out that banned books were associated with greater degrees of mental health symptoms, interestingly, mainly in girls. But this association was non-linear and only manifested in about 7% of participants, the subset of 19 out of 283 people who read the highest volume of banned books. In the same way that banned books can't be deemed a causality for civic involvement, these books also can't definitively be a determining factor in mental health symptoms, just based on this research. I'd love to hear from my audience members of all genders. Did you read challenged books, and if so, did you also experience mental health symptoms? Do you think there was any sort of correlation there? Do you think your mental health symptoms may have actually drawn you to more controversial books? I'm curious. Moving on, how do students feel about book bannings? Well, the New York Times compiled some user comments about that very subject. One student, Jason, correctly pointed out that these challenges to books often violate First Amendment rights. I feel like you've spoken about free speech before and the need for free speech and sort of supported Elon Musk's sentiments in that area. Would you say that you're a free speech supporter? Yeah. So how do you square the sort of being this free speech supporter with wanting to ban literature? What kind of literature? Any kind of literature. I mean, I, I would think that What kind of literature am I trying to ban? Oh, I thought you were just trying to say you're, that you have, I mean, you've made an effort to get books removed from schools. What kind of books? Books dealing with LGBTQ people and sexual No, that's education. not what I said. Oh, so you're not trying to get any books banned from school? Uh, that's not what I said either. Okay, why don't you explain to me what, how you're thinking about this? You just accused me of wanting to ban books. What kind of books am I trying to ban? Uh, you tell me. I'm not trying to ban anything. But you're not trying to ban any books. Who said I'm trying to ban books? Are you trying to remove books from libraries? From public school libraries. Okay. What you just saw there was Haya Raichik, owner of the Libs of TikTok Twitter account, wrestling with her cognitive dissonance. When interviewer Taylor Lorenz asked if there was a contradiction between supporting free speech and supporting the suppression of certain books, Haya first tried to qualify the books she was trying to ban, I assume in an attempt to suggest that some books are worthy of being banned. She then proceeded to lie and say she wasn't trying to ban any books, only to flip when pressed. 
And look, I'm not saying age restriction isn't a good idea. Obviously, there are books more suitable for high schoolers than for kindergartners. But when we enter this discussion, we must ask, who gets to decide which literature is for which age group? Well, certainly not Haya Reichik, a woman who was inexplicably appointed to the Oklahoma Library Media Advisory Committee by Oklahoma's state school superintendent, Ryan Walters. As this petition to get her off the library board will tell you, Reichik is not a citizen of Oklahoma, nor is she trained in library science or any form of education for that matter. Upon looking into it, the only credential one might find for this woman is a background in real estate. So there we have one answer. Librarians and educators should get to decide which books are suitable for which age group. And that just makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, these are people who studied multiple years for this very task, so unless there was a loud minority who didn't trust teachers, this wouldn't be a problem, right? Let's get back to what young readers think about book bans. Another student, Alex, rightfully pointed out that topics deemed inappropriate could actually be extremely beneficial for young readers trying to find themselves or process trauma. Alex's comment raises the question we were more or less just talking about. Who gets to decide what's inappropriate? This book is filled with advocates for the destruction of the nuclear family. Let me read you some passages and you tell me if this is a book you want your children to read. He shall lie all night between my breasts, his left hand under my head, and his right doth embrace me. Thy young breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. That was comedian Walter Masterson reading the Bible during a school board meeting, a meeting meant to deliberate whether the perks of being a wallflower should be banned from the school library. Now understand, Masterson doesn't do this in an actual effort to get the Bible banned from schools. No, I think that would undermine his efforts entirely. Masterson does this to highlight the hypocrisy of those who attempt to ban books. Because really, if you think about it, the Bible is a pretty horribly indecent book. Take it from one Utah parent who sought to remove the Bible from the Davis School District. They cited the violence and sexual content therein, writing, You'll no doubt find that the Bible, under Utah Code Section 76101227, has no serious values for minors because it's graphic by our new definition. Again, like Masterson, this parent was not actually trying to ban the Bible. They were trying to reveal the flaws with Utah's legislation that made book banning so easy. If you read the letter, that intention becomes clear. Quote, I thank the Utah Legislature and Utah Parents United for making this bad faith process so much easier and way more efficient. Now, we can all ban books and you don't even need to read them or be accurate about it. Heck, you don't even need to see the book. While the Bible was pulled from shelves for a short period, community backlash put it right back in libraries shortly after. Liz Mumford, the school board president, said, I recognize that our policy could use some refinements and improvements. No kidding, eh? Nevertheless, the Bible was reinstated because of its, in Liz's words, literary, artistic, historical, and political value for minors. And the thing is, I actually agree with that sentiment. I don't think students should have to read the Bible necessarily, but I still remember in AP Literature we had a packet covering the most famous biblical stories so we could recognize the biblical illusion and symbolism rife within Western literature. So I agree that the Bible does have a lot of merit in schools, but I have a hard time believing that's not the case for any book in a school library. If the Davis School District can reverse its decision on the Bible just like that, shouldn't it reverse other banning decisions? As one librarian, Allison Farmer, said at the time, As much as I hate to see any book removed at all, I feel like it's important that there's not an exception made because that's the law as it was. Republicans do this quite a bit. When Hudson booksellers chose not to sell Marjorie Taylor Greene's book, Donald Trump called it censorship. However, I would argue that Hudson Booksellers was exercising its right to refuse service to a non-protected class, a right that any business has. If Green's book were being banned from a public library, that would be a different story. Ron DeSantis' book ban policies blew up in his face as well when schools started removing books like The Dictionary as well as an illustrated Anne Frank novel. Of course, as you can imagine, DeSantis didn't blame his policies, he blamed so-called activists. Speaking of so-called activists, let's talk about Moms for Liberty. Parents have the right to determine what their children are taught and what they're allowed to read. No doubt about it. 
Uh, but what we're having a problem with is parents that want to determine what other parents' rights are for their children to read what they want. That was Richard Geyer, vice chair of the school board in Beaufort, South Carolina. He and the rest of the school board were caught off guard when they received an email listing 97 books that one parent thought should be banned. According to 60 Minutes, They're mostly young adult novels with minority, gay, lesbian, or transgender characters. Four of these 97 books were part of classroom curricula. One of Buford's librarians said it was obvious that the books hadn't been read prior to being challenged. 60 Minutes pointed to a website called booklooks.org, whose founder reported that the reviews were done by volunteers based on the site's own standards. That's where Moms for Liberty comes in. Members of the conservative education reform group Moms for Liberty either wield amateur reviews from booklooks or do the reviews themselves. Two of the organization's founders, Tiffany Justice and Tina Deskovich, sat down for an interview with 60 Minutes. One of them suggested that students in America were being indoctrinated into an ideology. The natural follow-up question was, of course... What ideology are they being indoctrinated into? Let's just say, children in America cannot read. They often dodged questions with talking points. The fact that Moms for Liberty's own founder can't qualify her claims of indoctrination tells me one of two things. Either she doesn't truly believe indoctrination is happening, or she doesn't want to say what she thinks is taking place because she knows it will sound absurd. Otherwise, why wouldn't she just come out and say it? Luckily, despite Moms for Liberty's shouts, the story of Beaufort, South Carolina has a pretty amazing ending as far as most of these situations go. 146 community volunteers offered to read the challenged books and meet with each other to discuss whether or not they had a place in schools. Of the 97 books that were challenged, five had their place in schools deemed unsuitable. On the one hand, it saddens me that any books were pulled, but on the other hand, I haven't read these books, so it's not my call to make. Also, this is unimportant, but one of the banned books was It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. Like I said, not important, I just thought it was kind of funny. And for the record, four other Hoover books were returned to school shelves. As much as I think this should be the job of teachers and librarians, these parents and community members perhaps found the most democratic way possible to approach sensitive reading materials in schools. So, back to the question that started this whole business. Is banning a book ever justified? Frankly, personally, I'd say no. Is age restricting a book justified? Probably yes. But one thing to note is that children will confront difficult subjects no matter what. Wouldn't we want them to confront these subjects in the safety of a school? And here's the main takeaway you should have from this video. Listen to educators. I assure you teachers know what they are talking about. I studied to be an English teacher and I did a decent amount of student teaching. Trust me, from my experience with all the teachers I worked with, they are well equipped to handle difficult topics. And even though I encourage everyone to listen to teachers and librarians, I don't want to take away the rights of parents. Buford actually has a good system for this too. Parents can always ask that their students be barred from checking out certain materials, and there are also opt-out forms that say, do not allow my child to check out any school library materials without my approval. If parents are truly concerned about what their kids might find in a library, they have proper channels through which they can go. But to close out, let me leave the vocal minority with this thought. The more you try to restrict something, the more likely youth are to do it. And in many cases, efforts to ban books only result in more exposure for the books. As one commenter wrote under a Humanist Report video, I swear to God, if you want to publish an LGBTQ book, you have to get a copy sent to Moms for Fascism. You cannot possibly pay for the kind of publicity genderqueer has received. And, well, case in point, I would have never even heard of Woke if not for the school districts that banned it. But, hey, what are your thoughts on book banning? What did you think of this video essay? Please tell me everything, and ultimately, keep in mind, this is a rough draft. And hey, if you like what I do here, consider supporting me on Patreon. You can get benefits like community Discord access, early access to videos, and priority review for works on the second channel. And feel free to subscribe over there if you want. I genuinely can't thank my patrons enough. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter to hear about what I'm reading and watching. 
and you can submit your work to me at the link below or to my P.O. box. Anyhow, take it easy.